Let's clap it up. My cousin got his own big company, his big business. And you know, business man, let's clap it up. If you need a bit of coffee, we got a black big store, fancy to go that are delivered to you here in Baltimore. So you need a nice king size mattress or whatever. You got you. So we got Brother Jabari in. So like I said, Brother Jabari is a pioneer. He's my mentor. Brother showed me how to cut hair. Uh, we go back in grade school and we continue to be friends. And, and brothers, and we got some huge campaigns that we're working on. This brother going to share something with you. So let's give our dear brother, our beloved brother, brother Jabari, another round of applause. Peace, family. Peace. Peace. All right, I don't know if you guys did it or not, but we always ask how the Africans feel. And then you say, spirit is strong, definitely strong. As loud as you possibly can. Can we do that? Yes, sir. All right, cool. How the Africans feel? Um, this is, this is, I mean, Dr. Boyce Watkins, man, I, I love this brother, man. You know, he, he's been helping us, helping the whole community for a long time. So we definitely appreciate that. So just want to say a few things. We do have, next Friday, we're going to have what's called a Bill Passion Party. I don't even know if that, people did that like that, but I asked one of the brothers, I said, is that, is that something that people do when they get a Bill Passion Party? I mean, so he said, I guess you could. So that's what we call a Bill Passion Party. So we changed the whole law. For the whole state of Maryland. Okay. So it's how to build, it's how to build 1317 is what it is. And now we still call it Master Barber can only have one apprentice training under them at one time. Now we switched it, we changed it, and now you can do three. As of next Friday, you can do three. So that's historical. We something that's something that we're real proud about. Change your laws, you know, for our community. So I want to, you know, we, we want to get Dr. Boyce up here, but before we bring up Dr. Boyce, I want to just say something about Dr. Mayak, who's one of our partners, who we've been doing this event with. Um, Dr. Mayak, I know her since she was a young lady, probably like 17 years old, when she used to come into the shop. Her dad used to get a haircut at the barber shop. And got a lot of respect for this young lady. You know, you know, Dr. Mayak, sometimes, you know, sometimes me and Dr. Mayak go through it. Like we, we've had some We've had some bang out arguments about some things before, you know what I mean? We'll go through it. But I tell you this, when that was Dr. Maya, when she ready to do some things in the community, she calls me. Hey brother Jabal, can I get you advice? Um, should I do book breaking? You think I should do it? You know what I mean? Like, or should I do this or should I do that? So she'll call me every time she has a, has a major thing to do. Because I mean, she respects me as a big brother. You know, but I really respect what she's doing. I was Mel Trek series, she got books out, um, doing different things, podcasts, so we want to bring this strong, powerful sister to the stage right now. Give it up, brothers and sisters, to Dr. Maya. Peace, Hotep, Alafiyani, and Asalaamu Alaikum family. Thank you so much for being here today and supporting this event. I want to just shout out, you know, just give him the love back, right? The, the reciprocity, give him the love back. Uh, Brother Jabari, I've known him since I was 17, I'm 40, I just turned 40 this year. And so we had 23 years then, and I can honestly say that he was a person who was very instrumental in my consciousness, in the development of my consciousness. He brought for years, Brother Jabari, uh, Brother Suliana, Reality Speaks, and they brought a number of speakers here, Dr. Francis Crest Wilson, all of the people that we love, Dr. Francis Crest Wilson, Andy T. Browder, um, Dr. Patricia Newton, uh, Bob, did Bob Baruti, is Bob Baruti coming here? Yeah. Bob Baruti, so the Barutis, um, oh my goodness, Ashwal Quazy, I mean, you name it, uh, he's brought them here. Umar Johnson, so a lot of the people that we come to know and uh, adore, uh, they were introduced to us through Reality Speaks. So I just want to give Brother Sudiata and, and Brother Jabari their flowers while they can smell them. So thank you so much, Brother Jabari. Uh, so today we have with us Dr. Boyce Watts. this brother for years on, on social media, on YouTube, and I follow his Instagram page, 
And uh, I also, with my son Harvey, who's sitting over there, uh, we attended his uh, National Black Convention in Philadelphia a few years ago. And that's when I had the honor of first meeting him, you know, in the, in the physical. But I can say that this brother is doing tremendous work for the black community. He's literally carrying the torch of the greats of Dr. Amos Wilson, who promoted the black business mentality. Dr. Claude Anderson, who for decades had promoted us adopting a black business mentality. So, you know, he stands on the shoulders of our ancestors. And so I appreciate you, Dr. Boyce Watkins, all that you're doing for us. And so why is adopting the black business mentality well, we need to create some wealth here, right? And so a lot of us have, you know, we operate with this mindset that we're going to get our education, right? Get an education and then get a job. And then we perpetuated that mindset to our children. We taught that same mindset to our children. So for example, those who know me know I teach at Morgan State University in the School of Engineering. And each semester I ask my students, and I have about 80 to 100 students each semester, and I ask them, I said, what do you want to do with your degree? When you graduate, and they say, Well, God, they call me Dr. Bailey. And Dr. Bailey, uh, um, well, when I get my degree, I want to get a job that pays seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year. I want to work for Oprah Grumman or Lockheed Martin, or I want to go to Google, I want to go to Facebook. And I say to them, I say, Has it ever occurred that you can be the next owner of a Google, owner of a Facebook, owner of a Lockheed Martin? Has that ever dawned on you? And so my students will look at me and say, no, I've never thought about that. And so while I'm at Morgan, I'm literally, while I'm in the classroom, I promote that mentality. We need to stop teaching our children an employee mindset, right? Dr. Amos Wilson said that it's too many of us, it's too many of us who operate with a servant mentality, right? He, he encouraged us in many interviews that I've watched with Dr. Amos Wilson to adopt and to teach a master mentality. So you go to school, you get educated, and you master these ideas and concepts, and then you go out and you create something. You go out and you produce something, and you build an institution, and you hire your own. And that is the mentality that we need to be inculcating in our youth, and that's the mentality that Dr. Boyce Watkins is going to be talking about today, developing a black business mentality. We need to create wealth, right? We need to create wealth, and wealth will bring what? Power. You can't be a powerful people if you don't have any wealth. The people who are wealthy are going to be the powerful people. And so we need to change our mentality. And so, Doc, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I won't be long, because my son, he always tells me I have to be long, because I have iron lungs. And so I won't be long, but I'm going to pass the mic back to you, Brother Javar. But thank you so much for listening. Give that again to Dr. Maya. That's Dr. Bruce Walker and how I know him. I always will have respect for Dr. Bruce Walker because when we put out a song with my daughters, my two people from the lobby, you may know who they are, called Letter to Little Wayne. And Dr. Bruce Walker took it to the internet. He defended my girl. We became friends. We started doing work together, business together. And Dr. Boyce Watkins would always say, that's my favorite group. That's my favorite female group of all time. And he would run like all their videos. He was networking, doing different things. So always got respect for this brother for defending my daughters. So, you know, even when we debated the barbershop out there sometimes, people like, no, my boy said this. My boy said this. Such a great time. But my young man, I'm um, coming cousin, cousin boys alone, man. You know what I mean? That's my man, you know what I mean? So you know, I never speak against him, you know what I mean? That's my, that's my brother. I appreciate it. Um, people say with these speeches, you know, why do y'all keep doing these lectures and stuff? These are rally sessions. They help to plant the seed, those different things. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, the, it's that motivational talk. Even when he talked with Dr. Mayotte last night, I was motivated. Like, yeah, that's right, Dr. Boys. That's right. But that's how I am. That's why I've been 26 years we've been doing this. So I bring all these lectures and they give us that motivation. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Adler. That's right, Dr. Wells. And it motivates me to keep doing what I've been doing for all these years. And these are motivational sessions that we actually have here. He's, the, he's one of the spirits of the movement right now, of the economic movement in our community. You know what I mean? You know how I like, I see football analogy. Ray Lewis for the Ravens used to be 
that motivation. Now, I want to hear nothing political that Ray Lewis got to say. He can keep that. If you're talking about motivational speech, if you're talking about football, I love Ray Lewis. That's my man. I love how he played the team. I love that spirit that he had. He brought that to the Ravens. When he left, that spirit left. Now, Lamar came in. Lamar had the spirit that Ray Lewis had. And all the team, they rally around. He had that motivation. That's what Dr. Boyce Watkins is to the business world today. You know what I mean? So we appreciate that. It constantly motivates us all the time. So uh, give it up for my mama, Mama Maya, in the building. Twenty-six years, twenty-six years she's been supporting me. She's been in every election except for about three. Maybe about three she's missed, maybe possibly. You know, but appreciate her, she's always been there by my side, and my stepdad, Mr. Egris, give him a big round of applause. <laughs> and I see my man, my man Dirk in the back, you know what I'm saying? That's my man right there, brother Sunyana's cousin, but he's like he's my cousin too. <laughs> We all came up together in Garden Village. Garden Village. You know, he said that this loud truck that he had a system in, old white truck, he used to drive us around, he came in there rocking on something like, yeah. You know, so I appreciate that. And my man E is in the building, give it up for his brother EJ in the building. <laughs> Do we have any other cities besides Baltimore in the building today? Where you are? Where you from? Greenville, Maryland. Green? We're really from Nashville, Tennessee. Greenville, Maryland. Greenville, Maryland? I know you've heard that before. Get up for Greenville, Maryland. Yeah. 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 I got you, got you. Oh, yeah. Philly in the building. Give him a big round of applause. Philly in the building. Who else got? Come back. New York, New York. New York in the building. Yeah. Yeah. Who else got? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Give him a big round of applause. Philly in the building.
Uh, maybe, maybe if you don't get as much chance to go uh, into different cities, I, I get to travel a little bit. Uh, I, I don't see what's happening here happening almost anywhere else. You know, there are variations of, of achievements that people are making, but Baltimore is extremely unique. Uh, what you have right down here on this, is it 25th Street? Is that right? Yes, sir. On 25th Street is uh, incredibly unique. And when you see something that works, the next job is to mass produce that. You multiply what works, right? So, uh, so, so that is something that I want you to be very proud of. Uh, also, uh, uh, the brother Sundiata, the Sundiata in here. Uh, give him a clap. So there he is. There he is. Sundiata. You know, I, I love talking to uh, uh, brother Jabari because. He was kind of telling me the, the, the history. And uh, he and Sudiana grew up together. They went to, uh, what was the high school? Patterson High School. And, and, and they, they were real cool. And, and, and for a little bit, they weren't cool. And then they became cool again because they're, they're both grown ass men that know how to uh, overcome their differences for the greater good. And, and what it made me think about is it made me think about life. And how in life, what you will find is that uh, sometimes your worst enemies, the people that can hurt you the most, are the people you were closest to at one point. Right? If you ever want to have a, a nasty fight, go, go, to, go to war with somebody that used to be right next to you. You know, that, that, that's very destructive. And I, and I said, the fact that you two actually took that energy that you could have used to continuously destroy each other, talk down on each other's name, you know, try to undermine what the other one was doing, you're actually using that energy to build. So, so I, I, I use a numerical example. I said, let's say that that that, that uh, I'm a six and my friend is a four, and, it, and and we go to war. So maybe because I'm a six, I think yeah, I can take you down because you just a four, right? But we go to war, and, and you and you your four hits me hard, right? So it becomes a, a minus, it becomes a negative. Six minus four is what? Two, right? So after the war is over, after I've won the battle. I done beat this Negro down, right? I took him out. I used to be a six, now I'm a two, because you made me bleed also, right? You didn't win, but you made me bleed, right? And you're a zero, so I feel like I won because I'm a two and you're a zero. But did anybody really win? Right, nobody won. Because what, what, I, what I've done is, is I think that I won, but really, I'm just not the biggest loser. We both lost because we took our energy and we chose to use it in a destructive manner as opposed to using it in a productive manner. So at the very least, I could win my way, you could win yours. I say a six, you stay a four, but let's say that we're really smart, right? Like Sundiata and Jabari, then I say, okay, you know, six minus four is two, and I am a six and you're a four, but six plus four is what? <laughs> right, so, so the, the best way for me to deal with an enemy is, or, or a potential enemy, it's not to defeat my enemy. It's also not just to maybe avoid my enemy. It might be to see if I can turn that potential enemy into a friend. Right? If I can take that potential adversary and make him an ally. Now we're both sitting on 10 because we've come together to work together. And, and, and I saw that manifest because I heard Sylvia and Jamari talk about a shop that they wanted to open together. Now, because they're grown men, and they were able to overcome their differences and engage in con whatever conflict resolution occurred and put the past behind them, they are now able to do things that would have been very difficult for them to do alone. So that is a powerful, important lesson. When you talk about that black business mentality, I, I felt that that story was perfect, a perfect prototype for exactly what we want to aim for when we're talking about what it means uh, to build business. Because, because if you look at the definition of things like corporation and all that, it always comes back to relationships. Uh, corporations, businesses, organizations, any organization is nothing more than a nexus of relationships, like a spider web. It's just a bunch of connections that people have with each other that allow you to get something done. Right? And, and so, so, so that mentality really uh, it, it's something that you really want to process. It, it's almost meditate on. And, and so what I really want you to do is think about it like this. So the black business mentality, and that, that's the title of our conversation today. So think about what mentality is. What's mentality? It's, it's what you think about. Right? If you're not thinking about it, then it's not part of your mentality. Right? And, and so, so when I grew up, I didn't even know the beginnings of having a 
black business mentality because I had a job seeker mentality. Right? I was thinking about how to get a job, how to fill out a resume, how to, uh, how to get a degree so you can apply for the job and be the best candidate, right? That was all we thought about, right? So, so you think about this, right? So how can you be good at something when you're not even thinking about it? Okay. If I'm not thinking about basketball all day at all, it's not even in my consciousness, then how am I going to be a great basketball player? Right? So, so a lot of developing economic strength and business strength comes down to asking yourself, what am I thinking about all day? What is in the spirit of my consciousness? So when we use that word conscious, a lot of people will say, I'm conscious. I'm in the conscious community. I'm woke. Are you really woke? A lot of people just know how to say the word woke. They can spell it. They, they know what conscious, they, they can kind of say it. But I don't even know if they're conscious enough about consciousness to know what consciousness really means. Consciousness, to me, being woke, is awareness. My conscious mind is observing what is around me, and I'm thinking about it, I'm analyzing, I'm breaking it down, I, I'm processing things so that I can think about what my next move should be. So when you talk about a black business mentality, first thing you got to do is you have to be woke to even know what that means. I, th that word consciousness. We have a lot of black folks that literally run away from the word conscious. Because they think, well, I don't want to be part of the conscious community because consciousness, consciousness. So when you say you don't want to be conscious, you're kind of saying you want to be unconscious. Mm -hmm. Which means you're not saying you want to be woke, you really want to be asleep. That's right. And, and if you look at uh, economics and in politics and pretty much everything else, the powers that be that take advantage of those who don't have as much power, it, they typically use methodologies that seep into your unconscious slash subconscious mind. They want you to be asleep because a person who is asleep, a person who is unconscious, is easy to exploit. Whether you're talking about a rapist who put something in somebody's drink, or if you talk about corporations who use tons and tons of subconscious manipulation strategies to get you to buy products, they don't want you to be conscious when you spend your money because if you're conscious, you're going to say, well, nah, I don't think I really need to spend this money. Well, I don't know, I don't know, let me think about that. I got to go home and process it. No, 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 we don't want you to go home. Right? Anybody ever seen that when they're they selling you a new car? They don't want you to go home and talk about it with your spouse and think about it. They want you to do a nap because they think they're tapping into your unconscious, subconscious mind. Right? Uh, the, the politics. Uh, they want you to keep voting for the same ridiculous politicians because that's just what you do because that's what your parents did and, and, and they're doing nothing for you. We see this. Uh, there's probably no great example in the country than Baltimore uh, of, of, of what happens when you have the same worthless politicians running the same areas as those areas get torn down and destroyed. Right? Uh, Chicago, where I'm from, same, same thing. So, so ultimately, this uh, lack of consciousness. That links, when I think about a black business mentality, it all comes back to consciousness and what it means to be woke. And the question is, are you conscious? Are you awake? And, and if anybody needs to be conscious uh, in, the, in this country, it has to be black people. Because they have spent hundreds of years systematically and strategically manipulating your subconscious and unconscious mind. They have taught you how to really hate each other. And you were social distancing before the pandemic ever began. <laughs> Right? I'm not going near that Negro. I don't want to do business with that. Right? And, and, and they, they have taught you to be afraid. Uh, they have taught you to be white supremacists. They have taught you to honor everything that is white. Uh, I, my hotel is right near uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. And when I saw Johns Hopkins, I saw the big sign. And I remember how excited my sister was in college when she got her internship at Johns Hopkins. And that was a big thing for our family. And then I started thinking about Johns Hopkins, and, and I'm sitting in the middle of this neighborhood, and I'm talking to my wife about it. I said, this looks like a neighborhood where there used to be a lot of black people, but, but I mean, you see some remnants of it, but I bet this is where the, this university, like a lot of them, bought up all the, all the property around it, right? And, and so now they, they kind of own it, and then I started thinking about Henrietta Lacks, and I started thinking about how we sort of, how we tend to put that whiteness on a pedestal. That's right. Know? And, and, that, and that really seeps into how we think about uh, economics. Right? When you talk about a black business mentality and you translated that into a job seeker mentality, what you're thinking, like Dr. Mahat mentioned earlier, you've got these young people with all the potential in the world who are sitting around saying, oh, I want to go work at Google. I want to go work at IBM. I want to go work at Nike, right? Because these big corporations, that there's, a, there's a value you would uh, uh, ascribe to that, right? Like, they, like they, you know, if you say, well, why don't you come down and, and work with Brother Jabari? <laughs> and really do the work that matters for your people, they say, ah, yeah, but, but being at Google is really cool. Like, that's, that, that has value. 
right? So when you talk about mentality, you talk about psychology, you have to really think carefully about what is being put into your conscious and subconscious mind. You, your conscious mind actually manages the subconscious mind. You must consciously manage your own subconscious to deal with all of the stuff that's been planted there that's keeping you from getting to where you want to get to. Okay? And, and I'm stepping into this uh, with, with, with a confession. My wife happens to be uh, an expert on the subconscious mind. And so we talk about that a lot. We talk about how the music is used to manage the subconscious mind of black people. If you listen to a lot of the songs on the radio, they are nothing more than blueprints for black male self-destruction. Mm -hmm. Right? Go, go have sex with every woman you can find so you can spread as many diseases as possible and make babies that you're never going to take care of. Go, if you get money, go down to Jake the Jeweler and drop $100,000 on some stupid gold chain that don't mean nothing and give all your money away to white people as quick as possible. Uh, if, you, if, if you're ignorant, then that's good. If you are intelligent, then that's bad because intelligence is boring, ignorance is lit, right? It's really cool to be so stupid you can't even spell your mama's name. Oh, if you see another black person, make sure you kill them immediately uh, because that is your job uh, to brag about how many black people you kill, right? And so, so ultimately, when you're talking about the manipulation of the subconscious mind and you're talking about building the mentality that develops uh, business, this is more than an economic discussion. This is a social, sociology discussion. This is a political discussion. This is a discussion about families. This is a discussion about self-love. This goes far deeper than just uh, how do I manage my 401k or how do I fill out the form to start an LLC. It goes into everything that was put into your brain to build you into who you are at this particular time. Now let me give you um, something, I, I'm gonna give you an acronym to help you understand, uh, to carry, carry something away from this discussion today. Uh, and this is, uh, this is not a speech I've given anywhere else. I, I try to make sure that I'm speaking specifically to exactly what I've been asked to speak on. And so, uh, so I think about things like Raise the Bar. I've written a book called It Takes a Village to Raise the Bar, a new paradigm for black America. You can have it for free. You can go to voicewalkings.com. Uh, the book's right there. Everybody can have it for free. Uh, and, 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 and so when you think about the word bar, like what it means to raise the bar, B-A-R. Well, the first thing I would say, if you try to develop a business mentality, is the B, which stands for thinking big. Let me explain. If, does anybody have people in your family that, because they love you so much, they literally just shit on every good idea that you ever had? <laughs> <laughs> like, they literally like, well, it's because I love you, and I just want to warn you that if you start that business, you know it ain't going to work out, because ain't nobody going to buy no tea. People ain't buying that stuff no more. You don't know what you're doing. You're going to put that good job at the post office, right? And you're like, okay, I love you, but I don't need you know, all that love right now. And they'll do it because they care about you, right? They don't want you to go crazy. Because when you start thinking different from other people, people start automatically thinking you're crazy. Because that definition of what we call, we call normal, normal typically, fits right. okay. into, you know, what they call normal kind of means conforming, right? If, if, even if everybody else is, is acting weird and doing something that makes no sense, uh, if I want to be normal, I do what everyone else does. That, and, and, and people do operate literally like sheep. They call that a herding effect. It's actually it's something they've written actual research papers on in finance and economics, where they talk about how people will go along with the crowd just to fit in with the crowd because it's just more comfortable to kind of do what everybody else is doing. So if you're in a family where everybody in the family has done the same self-destructive crap generation after generation, you're going to feel comfortable doing that because, again, because you haven't gotten conscious to how these things are destroyed, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to be uh, uncomfortable, you don't want to be the weirdo at the barbecue, you might go along and do what everybody else is doing, right? So if everybody else is going out looking for a job, then you're going to go out looking for jobs too. So one of the things about uh, thinking big or becoming a big business owner is this. Look, here's the thing that you got to understand. A lot of the businesses that many of us have created a lot of the businesses that you may own in this room or you're thinking about creating in this room, a lot of businesses and business owners end up feeling a little bit raggedy. I don't know if anybody's ever felt raggedy with your business, like you didn't know what you were doing, you know, you weren't making no money, and that just confirms the fact that you that you're just not cut out to do this, and you can't, you're not smart enough, you, you know, because it's easy for you to believe that somebody else became a millionaire, but it's kind of, sometimes it's hard for us to believe that we can do it until we start getting that validation and confirmation from other people, and I, and I raised my hand because I went through the same process, right? And, and, and one of the things I want you to kind of understand is that 
If you look at the history of most of the great corporations in America, all these companies that people admire, the companies that our smartest, brightest children want to go work for, a lot of these businesses started off incredibly raggy. Uh, one of the things I used to do to try to get myself pumped up and motivated onto what, the, what my potential could be is I would read the, the origins of some of the biggest corporations in America. So one of them that I was reading about this week is UPS. I had a friend that worked at UPS. She came to visit me, but we were talking about the company and the history. And I said, let me look up the history of UPS. And I said, did you know that UPS was started by a couple of teenagers who had bicycles? Wow. They literally were delivering packages on their bikes mm -hmm. around town. And that grew into UPS, which is worth about $162 billion. Now, I bet you that if you went back 100 years and you told those teenagers that their little raggedy business they started where they're delivering packages on bikes was going to grow into a company worth $160 billion within a couple of generations, they wouldn't have believed it. They would have thought you were crazy. They'd be like, no, we're just trying to make $50 this week. <laughs> right? But that grew into UPS. Uh, Coca-Cola Coca was started by a man, I forgot his name, but he uh, was a, a morphine addict, and he left the Civil War, and he used morphine a lot, and he said, morphine is not good for me, which obviously is not. And so he created Coca-Cola because he needed something better than morphine. So he put a little cocaine in it, or whatever, made his little drink. Of course, everybody loved it, because I guess cocaine is good. I don't know, I've heard of that. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and and literally, so literally, this, this thing becomes popular, and it, it is selling pretty good. But he didn't he didn't see that Coke was going to grow into a, a company that's worth a couple hundred billion dollars two or three or four generations later. So he sold the rights to Coca Cola for about maybe a thousand dollars. He sold the rights to somebody else who didn't saw the potential and took it on. So so here's the deal. Um, a lot of my bet is, in fact, I just know this for a fact. A lot of the businesses that might be in this room from people that are listening to this conversation right now are, are probably pretty raggedy and you're probably a little embarrassed, almost to the point where you're like that mother who just loves the hell out of her ugly baby. Uh, but some of these businesses are going to grow into multi-billion dollar corporations. That's a lot of the baby that you have. That's of a business you have where you don't have to know what's going on, don't know how to really even do your taxes right, is going to grow into a multi-billion dollar organization that is going to feed your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Yes. And they're going to have your picture on the wall 100 years from today because they're going to say, that's where grandma started all back in Baltimore. Right. Do you understand? understand? Now, it ain't going to happen with everybody. Some of your businesses, some of your businesses are just not going to make it. <laughs> that, that happens. But some of you are going to have that legacy. I don't know who's going to do it, but here's the, here's the thing that, that you have to understand is that there is a finality in death. When you kill that little bit baby business you have, when you just give up and you give up hope, then you virtually guarantee that whatever that future is going to be is not going to exist. Whatever's going to happen for your, your descendants is not going to occur. And you have to remember that, right? You, you're not, you're not the, the, the modern Negro. You're not, the, you're not sort of you know, living in the present. You're really living in the past. You are the ancestors. You are the ancestors. And, and a lot of the business mentality comes from having the vision and the ability to visualize things that have not come to pass yet. To visualize, well, what does the next 100 years look like for my family? I mean, think about this. I talked to Dr. Malad about this yesterday, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, can you imagine what it would look like if somebody from 1921 wrote a letter or, or had a speech in a conversation where they were talking to the people of the year 2021 and saying, these are the things that we're putting in place right now so that you guys are going to be good 100 years from today? Can you think about how amazing that would be? So why don't you go be amazing? Have that conversation with your unborn children. Your unborn grandchildren. Let them know what you're doing for them right now that's going to prepare them for the future. Because these little seeds that you plant, these little so called raggedy businesses that, that ain't making no money, some of these businesses will grow into economic empires. And it's up to you to decide if you are going to be the protectors and the keepers of that legacy. Are you going to protect the baby while it's tiny, small, vulnerable, and a little ugly so that it can grow into the big, strong thing that it's supposed to be later on? God has a plan for you. Don't kill the plant. Next, we talked about the word bar, B-A-R. So think big. A is accumulate. A lot of people don't understand that wealth is an accumulation process, just like snow. It starts snowing, individual snowflakes 
mean nothing, they're just tiny, they go away. But if you get trillions of snowflakes falling consistently, eventually you have an accumulation, and so you got a snowstorm, right? So wealth is an accumulation process. This accumulation process typically occurs across generations. And in order for you to accumulate gold, you must first begin the process of preserving. You have to stop the leap. So let's start with an analogy. Lamar Jackson, I love Lamar Jackson because Lamar Jackson played for Louisville, where I'm from. I'm from the, the city of Louisville. And when Lamar was at Louisville, we knew he was going to be great. And I and God bless Baltimore because that boy's a bad, an amazing football player. Now, here's the thing. Uh, can anybody tell me what is the number one job of the quarterback? What is Lamar's number one job as quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens? Any, any sports fans that can tell me that? What is this? It's a throw the ball, run the ball, score touchdown. What is it? Protect the ball. Protect the ball. Protect the ball. Because if he doesn't protect the ball, then nothing else matters. The number one job of the quarterback is to protect the ball. That's why when the play goes dead, it goes bad. Sometimes they may want to spread more around, but if it's really bad, well, they, they just get on the ball and cover it up, right? So you can keep possession so you can make the next play. So when you talk about wealth, the number one job that we have to focus on in our community, before we talk about accumulation, is you must protect the ball. See, as a community, we're not really protecting the ball. This is not our fault. I don't think we can be blamed for this entirely. But the, the inability or lack of desire to protect the economic ball is causing black wealth to actually go down over time. It's one thing if you're not, it's like if you're in a race, it's one thing if you're not catching up. It's another thing if you're running backward and you think you're running forward. A lot of the things that we identify as so-called progress are not progress at all. It's a, it's a complete illusion. Uh, there is a massive, massive wealth drain occurring in our community. It is a, a drain of our money, which comes from being trained mentally to be consumers as opposed to producers. Uh, it's a drain that comes from things like student loans, where you have uh, a lot of educated Negroes like me who thought that going to college was the only way you could actually make progress. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to college, but the problem is that the average black college graduate cannot repay their student loans. So if you default on the student loans, which means you get bad credit, and your net worth is negative, and you have nothing to leave your children, then game over. You lost the game. You might have letters behind your name, but you still lost the wealth game. Doesn't mean college is bad, but you still lost the wealth game. Because you pretty much, to some extent, have become, you've been put in the same position as a sharecropper. That's how sharecropping kind of work. You put people in so much debt that they have to work for you forever. So because you're in all this debt, and I come to you and I say, hey, let's start that business. Well, I can't because I got these student loans. I got to keep this job, right? Or let's go and make an investment. Well, I can't because my credit's bad because the student loans and da da da, right? Right. So effectively, we have a lot of highly educated sharecroppers in our community. They just don't think they're sharecroppers because they don't work on the farm. You work on a corporate plantation as opposed to the old school plantation. The plantation is still here, they just look different. Slavery is still somewhat similar, it just, it's a different kind of slavery. It's a, it's a capitalist slavery, which is much more subtle. See, but if you're not conscious, if you're not woke, if you're not aware, then you won't even see it. Right, and that's the best type of slavery, when they don't know that they're slaves. You give them the illusion of freedom, not actual freedom. So, so you have a drain, you have drains on not just uh, your money, uh, and, and your wealth and in different ways, you have drains on uh, a lot of your, your, your best athletes and entertainers that come out of the community, those industries are owned by other people. You have drains on your time. If I spend uh, 40 hours a week working for a corporation, that 40 hours a week, if I work 50 weeks a year, that's about 2,000 hours a year over a decade, that's 20,000 hours in a decade, uh, over a 50 year working career, that's 100,000 hours. That's 100,000 hours I have spent not building black wealth, but I have spent 100,000 hours building white people. So if millions of black people are being trained to give 100,000 hours of labor toward building white institutions, then why wouldn't these institutions be powerful and wealthy and successful? Because they're getting up everything they got and they're getting everything that you've got. That 40 hours a week that you're putting structurally, you're structurally putting that into businesses that are owned by other people, 
So other people are getting rich off of you, not just because they're getting your $4.4 trillion in five dollars, that's bad enough, but they're also getting things that are much more important than your consumer dollars, which is your time and your labor and your energy. A lot of our people don't even have time to build a family because you're spending most of your time at work. Like, you ever see somebody at a, at a barbecue and you're like, hey man, what you been up to? Oh, nothing, just working. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? Right? You spend more time with your boss than you spend with your kids. How does that work out for the family? And that doesn't help the family. Right? So, so consciousness means sort of structurally backing up and saying, what am I doing with my time? What are we doing with our resources? You see, one, of you, one thing you may not know is that you're actually, you're actually born a millionaire. You, you just don't think you were born a millionaire because somebody didn't leave you any money. But you were born a millionaire, and I'm not just trying to make you feel good. I'm not just trying to, you know, uh, tickle you and, and, and blow smoke up you. But I'm, I'm, you really were born a millionaire. Let me explain why. There's a type of capital that is not financial. Most, in fact, most wealth is not even money. Most wealth involves certain things like what they call human capital. Human capital is very real. You know it's real because uh, during slavery, when they owned your ancestors, that was real wealth. You could go uh, as a slave owner and you could say, I, I don't think, say, well, what? Well, you can go to the bank and say, I want a loan. And they say, well, well, do you have any money? They say, no, I don't have any money, but I own 25 Negroes. Oh, well, you can borrow against the, your Negroes. You can borrow against these black people, right? So, so you were capital. You were seen that way. They, they had banking systems around all of that, right? So now that capital has been released a little bit, right? Now you own that human capital. Right? When you are a young, healthy black man or black woman, you have that ability to get up and work hard for somebody for at least 40, 50, 60 hours a week, right? which has a tremendous amount of value. If you add it up over the course of a lifetime, that's millions of dollars in wealth right there. So because you don't have as much financial capital as you want, what ends up happening is you end up selling yourself back into slavery. You sell yourself, you sell that human capital, you lease it out to somebody who pays you money, right? And they pay you this much, but they're making, they're making, they're making three times more uh, from your labor than you're getting. So you're getting $20 an hour, maybe they're making $50, $60 an hour from their labor, right? And, 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 and you're doing this because that's what you're trained to do. And, and the system is, is, is structured that way. This didn't happen by accident. The capitalists at the top of the pile, they plan these things. They say, okay, we need more workers. Uh, let's create a, a, a women's liberation movement that's going to make women feel uh, that they're inferior if they spend time with their kids uh, and that they're superior if they go work in the factory all day, right? And, and so that way we'll have more women in the workforce. Let's, uh, let, let's integrate black people. Let's give them integration and civil rights and give them the, the right and the ability and the opportunity to come in and, and work for us so that we're not really giving them any real wealth, any real control, any real ownership. We're just giving them their self-esteem back. They get to sit next to us at the table so that makes them feel better, that makes them feel more accomplished because whiteness is a brand as well, which uh, is because we're trained to be white supremacists, we want to be next to that, right? So ultimately, a lot of your capital in your family and in your community is being given away and is being sold cheap. So a lot of the black business mentality or the, the wealth builder mentality comes from saying, how do we stop the leak? How do we protect the wall? Well, the wealth is already here. Rather than me, again, mentally, this all goes back to the mind, right? Uh, instead of me thinking somehow that being black is a curse, Actually, maybe I can realize that being black is a blessing. That's right. We have tremendous amounts of capital right there in our family. If you have four hardworking siblings that uh, they're all smart, decent people, and highly educated, then you got millions of dollars in human capital right there in their family. But if, if I'm sitting there thinking, well, if my mentality is, well, I got to go get me a job now, now that I've got all this education and all this work ethic, I'm going to go find a job working for him, and my sister's going to go work for her, and my brother's going to go work for her, and my other sister's going to go work for him. Well, then what's happened is you haven't protected the ball. It's like having uh, air conditioning in your room, and you've left the window open. It's 100 degrees outside, and you wonder why the room doesn't stay cool. Well, because you need to close the window. You're letting all of your wealth, all your capital, all your potential go out the door because there is wealth in human beings and the labor that you provide and the skill sets that you provide. 
In this room right now, with just the people that are in this room, we could create millions of dollars in wealth by simply coming together, working together, and being committed to working together. But that starts up here. If I don't like you, I'm not going to work with you. If I am, uh, if I, if none of us obtain the skill necessary to uh, to develop and build what we're trying to create, then we can't make anything happen. If none of us has any vision about what we can actually do together, then, then we're not going to succeed. So when you talk about the black business mentality, it's, it's a really deep concept. It doesn't just involve the conscious and subconscious mind, but it comes down to things like, like things, things mushy stuff, like, like love and, and confidence and hope and faith, right? So it almost sounds like you're in church because let me tell you why faith does make a difference. And faith is also psychological. Now, has anybody heard the word risk in business? You know what I mean? When, when I say that that's a risky decision, you know what I mean. Most everybody knows, but even the children know what I mean, right? Well, the thing about risk is risk is a two-sided coin, right? It means everything can go good or everything can go bad, right? It, it depends on what happens. Well, did you all know that people who have been traumatized, which we have in, in a million different ways, historically been traumatized, people who are traumatized are less likely to take risk because when they see a risk, they don't see the upside, they only see the downside. So when you have those loved ones, those Negro naysayers in your family, you know, Negro, Negro naysayers are people that find a problem for every solution, right? What you're really seeing is the manifestation of trauma. You're seeing traumatized people who are only seeing the downside. They're only seeing all the reasons why that risk you're about to take is not gonna work. Because they're scared. We know that trauma leads to drama. It doesn't just lead to negativity, it can also lead to conflict. Uh, you, so, so we're going back not just to things that involve setting up businesses and organizations. Like, I can show you all that, right? That stuff is easy to teach. But what you have to teach yourself is how to unlearn all the things that you've been taught about yourself. Right. All the things that, that you feel uh, when it comes to your own people, your own brothers, your own family, your own potential. You, that part is internal. That's not something you're going to pick up in a book. Because if you look at most people that become great business owners and make millions of dollars and all this other stuff, you'll usually find that it isn't just their skill set that separates them. It's usually something spiritual. Like they're going for it. They're jumping out there. They want to meet everybody. They greet people with a smile, right? They're forming healthy relationships, right? Which is the R when it comes to racing the bar, right? Think big, accumulate relationships. Let me explain how important relationships are. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a young lady that I mentored, and, uh, and she has four sisters. And one sister is like a nurse's aide, the other one works at four, the other one is a hairstylist, the other one does something else. And, I, and, and they're all struggling. Everybody's struggling. When you divide it, you struggle. That's what happens. This whole rugged individual, a rugged individualism they teach, that's a bunch of nonsense. Like, you gotta go back to Africa where they talk about, you know, if you wanna go fast, go long, if you wanna go far, go together. You let go of that individualism crap, because it doesn't work. So, so all the sisters are out there individually. All of them are single mothers. All of them are struggling. Uh, the lowest net worth in America is the single black mother. The median net worth of a single black mother is zero dollars. Uh, right there with her is the father with multiple children and multiple households. So even little things like how you structure your family is absolutely essential in how you build wealth. Who you choose to partner with, who you choose to have in your life, who you choose to have relationships with is everything. This is literally something that should be taught in school. How to pick a baby daddy, how to pick a baby mama, how to pick a husband, how to pick a wife. Literally. Literally. So I was talking to her and I said, Okay, so you're struggling here, your sister's struggling here, your sister's struggling there. I said, why don't you all work together? I said, you know, she's a hairstylist and you can help her in her shop and you can expand the shop and you can do this and do that. And you know what she said? She said, I can't work with my sister. Like, I can't. They, she can, because she be lying and, and she's da da da. And it was one of those things like, I don't want to be around, you know, my siblings, right? And I get that, right? We all have gone through that. We all have family members that we just don't ever want to talk to them, ever. <laughs> they call you, you do not pick up the phone, right? I understand that. But then I was sitting there thinking about how much wealth is lost by the fact that they can't 
resolve their conflicts and find some way to align their incentives so they can work together to help each other out of the struggle. And then I thought about how many families we have in our community that have the same problem. And then I thought about the fact that many of those problems come back to the, to the fact that we have so much trauma that we've all experienced personally, and also cultural trauma that, that has gone that has existed across generations. So here's what I figured out. I figured out that we all probably need therapy. Yeah. Every one of us. I know I do. Yeah. I get triggered all the time. My wife was like, you're getting triggered now. I'm like, damn. <laughs> that's, that's that other voice coming out that's thinking about the things that happened to me as a kid. You know, I, I, had, you know, I didn't have no daddy. I had a father that raised me. He was a, a Vietnam veteran that was very abusive. And, and just, just a lot of little things. You know, we all got our stuff, right? And so I would almost encourage anybody, when you're talking about building business and what a business mentality looks like, do not underestimate the significance of relationships. A person that has good, strong, healthy relationships can get things done very easily that would be almost impossible to do if they were doing it alone. Mm -hmm. Relationships are actually everything. If you look at the definition of a corporation, one of the definitions is a corporation is nothing more than a nexus of relationships. It's a group of people who got together and formed almost like a gang, kind of like an economic gang. Like Apple. Apple is just a big economic gang because they all wear the same colors, speak the same language, they have the same goal, the same objective, they got a hierarchy, you know, just like the Bloods and the Crips, right? And they're making trillions of dollars all throughout the world because they, they are on coal. They have the ability to work together to achieve a common objective. If you deviate, then you get booted out. And then I started looking around and I realized that when you talk about the game of global economic warfare, there's a lot of gang activity happening out here. A lot of people, a lot of gang affiliations. You know, uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's just an economic gang. That's when the US, Canada, and Mexico got together and said, let's protect our economic interests with each other. You go to the Asian Pacific, you know, that's an economic gang. The Asian countries got together and said, we're going to trade, we have free trade amongst one another so we can all get money. The European Economic Union is a gang. Uh, IBM is a gang, right? Everything is a gang. I mean, gangs are everywhere, right? And, and the thing about it is, when I started thinking about this, I said, okay, this makes sense because the, the innate, natural, desirability to align with and to come closer to people that are similar to you where you can achieve common goals and the very least have safety and security and then, and then eventually uh, some sort of accumulation. That's not just, that's not something you have to be taught in school. Even animals know this. Right? When I go running and I see all these geese, there's hundreds of geese all together and I'm like, nobody taught those geese that they should come together and be with other geese. They just didn't get anything to do it. Right, so sometimes I think that what we've gone through has taken away our natural instincts in terms of understanding how important it is for us to come together when it comes to achieving a common objective. Your first gang is your family. And the reason that they work so hard to destroy the family and to particularly get rid of the father and to convince you that you don't need the father and they locked all the fathers up in prison. A lot of your strongest black men are in the penitentiary right now. Uh, it's because once you take away that protection and that leadership and that structure of the economic gang, it's very easy to infiltrate. You can infiltrate with, with very bad ideas, you can extract resources, you can come in and kind of take whatever you want because you don't have that structure, you don't have that security, you don't have that protection. Also, you have chaos. If, if I go to the south side of Chicago, they've always had gangs on the south side of Chicago, but not gangs like this. The, the gangs today are the gangs that, uh, that you didn't see in the 70s. At least in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you had gangs that were a little more structured, had a hierarchy. Now it's just dudes running around with AK shooting each other down. You know, some angry 17-year-old that kills another one because he made a rap song about him, or whatever they call it, drill hop, I guess. I rap about you, and then you come and shoot up my whole family, whatever it is, right? So ultimately, this loss of connection, it, which is driven by the trauma, is not just something that affects gang activity in the South Side of Chicago, it affects many of us in terms of how we conduct our lives. You're not supposed to be doing everything by yourself. Now some of you may be in the unfortunate position where you have relatives that are not interested in getting on hold, that are too uh, tarnished and backward in their thinking to even work with you on anything. But what I learned actually was I learned that you can actually form a family anywhere. Uh, I don't care if you're related to me by blood. Uh, when I talk to Jamari, that is, that's a sibling to me. That's a, that's a relative. 
You know, it's not, it doesn't matter who our mothers and fathers are in my view. We, we understand each other, we're all cold, we, we support each other. I support him, he supports me. That's how we're more successful. We have to do that because there's nobody hating more in this country than the black man. They're keeping us one us dead. They want us gone. Especially the masculine black male. Oh, yes. Right? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, if you want to be a little boy or you know, whatever, to, to do all these other things that they got on TV, then that's cool. But if you are a black male that is masculine, you pretty much are an endangered species. You are seen as a threat every single way. So when I talk to other black men uh, that understand family, that understand the importance of the mission that, that we are seeking to accomplish, my goal is in a million years, I never want you to become my enemy. Even if you are my enemy, I'm either going to, uh, I'm not going to retaliate against you or I'm going to find a way to build with you. Because we must build together in order for all of us to be safe and protected and successful. So when you, if you want to get a really good skill for building business, go take the time to directly, specifically study how to build healthy relationships. How to be helpful and beneficial to other people. How to build a strong, healthy family. Start with a relationship with yourself. That therapist will help you dig into your nonsense so that when you are triggered, you're not going to react in a way that is destructive to the situation that you're in. Because that trauma that causes you to be triggered is driven by a type of fear. Fear is the enemy of healthy relationships. Let me explain. This is not just an emotional concept. This is an economic concept. There is something that measures economics called consumer confidence. Anybody heard of that? Consumer confidence is measured why? Well, because when consumer confidence is high, uh, then what happens is the economy takes off. And uh, when it's low, the economy starts to sink. There's also another measuring stick they use in the stock market called the fear index. And they measure that because they know that when people are afraid, the economy starts to sink. Well, why does it start to sink? Let's think about that. Let's, let's, let's break that down in the context of relationships. Well, if I am afraid of you, I'm not going to form a healthy relationship with you, right? If I'm dating a woman and I'm scared of getting hurt, she's scared of getting hurt, then neither one of us is going to trust each other. And the first sign that we see of, of either person getting out of line, we're going to run, right? Or she, she was 10 minutes late, but well, that means she's not responsible, so I got, I got to get out of here. I can't, I can't deal with that. I can't deal with that no more, right? Because I got that in my last relationship and I ain't doing it, right? Right? You know, you, know, you got the track stars, right? Well, the same thing happens economically. When there is fear in the economy, uh, the banks are afraid to make loans because they're afraid of not getting paid back. So they hold on to their money, right? Uh, the corporations are afraid of going under. They don't know if the consumers are going to come through for them and buy their products. So they don't make investments. They don't hire anybody. They, they don't make any investments in the economy because they they got they, they think, okay, i got to hold on to my money because I don't want any bad things to happen. Uh, the uh, consumer, when they are afraid, do they go out and spend lots of money? No, they don't. They hoard their money. So the companies start to sink because the consumers aren't showing up. So the companies aren't hiring anybody because they're not making any money. And the banks aren't making loans because, because the economy is sinking. So that fear, when they get that old saying from FDR when he said they have nothing to fear but fear itself, that is absolutely real. So I started thinking about this in terms of our community, and I thought about how the trauma can breed so much fear. You know, it is not what we're doing right now. By having this commitment to building black-owned business in a black community, I think you are, in my view, the greatest heroes in this country. You are the talented 10, in my view, not because of education or economic status. You're the talented 10 because you have courage that a lot of people don't have. Because I, I can tell you, I bet if I say, how many of y'all have been hurt badly by another person that looked like you? Raise your hand. How many of you have barely been hurt by maybe you did business with somebody, they ripped you off? Maybe you bought a product from a black owned business and they, they didn't give you what you paid for? Or maybe you run a business and you dealt with a customer that, 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 that tried to destroy your business, right? It's very scary. There's a lot of re-traumatizing that occurs when you're talking about a traumatized community. So the ability to really love and to understand that love is more powerful than hate, it, that therapy piece is incredibly important because it allows you to process what has happened to you in a way where you're not going to let that cause you uh, to stay away from the people that you need to be with. Right? So, so I'm going to tell you, I, I get it all the time. When I'm, when I'm doing stuff in my career, in fact, when I my business, I had a lot of people that told me, look, don't be trying to do this with black people. This whole economic stuff, financial literacy and all that. Black people ain't ready for it, they don't want to hear it. They, you know, they, they'll do X, Y, Z to you, and just because they black don't mean to say. 
And, and I'm going to tell you the truth, this happened. I mean, I have been hurt so badly by people that, that I, did, well, I still don't understand what happened. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and, so, and, and so ultimately that decision to kind of look my way through it and to say, you know what, I got to process this in a healthy way so I can keep moving forward without fear, that is what has allowed me to be successful in the things that I do, right? So for all of you, I encourage you to do the work, get the therapy, study how to build healthy relationships with other people because if you are help, helpful to others, if you are bringing healthy energy into the spaces that, that you occupy, people will want to work with you, good people will want to be around you, good people will want to build with you. The other piece that you want to add in there is when you're talking about skill set. Uh, every black child in America by the age of 12 should learn how to start their own business. That should be a rite of passage. Even if you don't want to be a business owner, even if you want to work for somebody else, you still need to know how to start your own business just in case you lose that job. Just to have an extra skill set. Just to have another stream of income. Also, every child in our community should own shares of stock as early as possible. Particularly, maybe you have a newborn baby, give your baby some shares of stock as a happy birthday present. Buy them shares every week consistently on autopilot, and then they'll be independently wealthy by the time they're 25 years old. What does that do? That takes them out of the struggle. That keeps them from having to sell themselves into slavery in order to make money, right? Uh, the third piece is when you talk about a real estate ownership. Everybody must own something. Not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody has to be the boss. Everybody can be the boss, right? And it, it, that's one thing too that I want to make sure we understand is that I hear a lot of people say, we have, you, know, you have to run your own thing, run your own this, run your own that. And I get that, right? I totally get that. But I have a lot of partnerships with people where they're running everything and I'm just doing what they ask me to do. Like right now, I'm not running this event. Jabari and, and, and the brother Sudiata and, and, and Dr. Mott and, and others, they're the bosses of this, right? I'm coming in pretty much as the employee of the day in their space. And then maybe there's another situation where I'm running something and they're coming in to support me, right? So, so when you talk about this boss mentality, don't allow that to get you to the point where you're ego tripping and you don't know when to take a back seat and let someone else take the lead. In fact, it's hard to kind of feel like you have to be the boss of everything and own everything and do everything for yourself. In fact, I've seen people destroy good opportunities because they need to own it all, right? They, they need to be the boss of everything. No, no, this is called cooperation. I'm not here to train you to be a capitalist or a, definitely not a hardcore capitalist. I'm here to show you how free enterprise and wealth and business ownership can give you the freedom that you deserve as, as people in the country that doesn't necessarily want to help you. That's what you want to do. You want to see wealth as a pathway to what really matters in life, what really matters are things like freedom and happiness. When I talk to my 10-year-old, I'll, I'll share this story and then I'll stop so we can uh, maybe answer some questions. Uh, my 10-year-old came in and she said, uh, she said, boys, what did you want to be? She calls me boys, but I'm her, I'm her stepfather, but I'm her father, if you know what that means. She's mine, right? When, when those kids are all mine, period. And uh, so she comes in, she says, boys, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I said, um, hmm, I don't know. I, I think I wanted to play in the NFL or something. I don't, I don't remember. And, uh, and, and, she, and I said, so what about you? What are you thinking about? She said, well, I was thinking about becoming a, a dancer and a teacher and an engineer. And I was like, okay, that's nice, that's nice. I said, okay, so let's talk about growing up and, and what that means. And then now, now mind you, the, the conversation I've had with my parents is, well, this is the type of job you want to get. You know, you get a good job, make good money, blah, 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 all that. You don't know the whole story. You don't know, your parents have the same conversation. But I said, let's talk about something a little more important than that. Let's, let's, I said, Do you, have you ever heard of the inalienable rights? And she said, no. And I said, well, the inalienable rights are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a European concept, but I like that concept. And, um, and, uh, and, and I said, so what does that mean? Think about this. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you know what it means to have life. Liberty kind of means freedom. And let's talk about the last one, the pursuit of happiness. So that means that uh, happiness is something that you desire and you need to go pursue that, right? And I said, so a lot of people don't know how to be happy in life because they don't even know what happiness looks like, right? Because again, consciousness, right? If, if you're not conscious, then you think happiness is a, a Lamborghini in the driveway and a big house 
and a million dollar paycheck. And that's why you have these celebrities that become suicidal when they have all the money in the world and all the fame in the world and all the women in the world. And they don't, they, they, the, the reason that they, they're sad is because they don't understand that that really wasn't what actually was going to make you happy. You haven't even taken the time to even figure that out. I said, so knowledge of self really is kind of the first thing you have to have to say, okay, what really makes me happy? And, and, and then once you figure out what's going to make you happy, the next step is figure out where the happiness is. Like, what, what does that mean in that moment? Because it can change, right? So some days, happiness might mean going to the movies. Other days, happiness might mean calling my mother on the phone. Another day, happiness might mean uh, going to the gym or sleeping in or, or whatever, right? So, so happiness is located somewhere out here. I figured out what it is and where it's at. Now I gotta go pursue happiness, right? And I, so I told her, I said, a lot of people can't be happy because one, they don't know how to be happy, and then two, they can't pursue happiness, and the reason they can't pursue happiness is because they gotta go to work, right? So you get up and you work at Ford, and I bet you that for 99.9% of all Ford employees, happiness that day is not in the Ford plan. It is not only assembly Ford, right? But you can't go pursue happiness because you are uh, locked into the corporate plantation. So I said, the best thing I can do for you as your father is to uh, help you figure out what's going to make you happy. Because that's why you do all this stuff. You, do, you go out and make money and work hard and all this stuff so you can be happy. If you're not happy, then you've lost the game. Right? So, uh, so I said, so, so here's what um, I want you to understand. Happiness is like the sibling of freedom. Because if you are free, then you have the freedom to pursue happiness. So a free person with knowledge of self is most likely, in my view, to be happy because they know what's going to make them happy and they have the freedom to pursue it. And I said, uh, next to freedom is economic freedom because if you've got economic freedom, then money does not become a barrier for you to pursue the happiness that your heart desires. Right? You say, you know what, happiness means going on a vacation right now to Fiji and uh, I'm going to book the ticket and just go because I've got the time and i got the money and it's good, right? So what I told her that day, and I probably gave her like the most confusing answer that a father could give a 10 year old, but uh, I think she can handle it and I had, we had to have that conversation. So I said, I think the best advice I can give you as a young black woman is to be economically independent and strong. That means uh, I'm going to do my part. I've got some assets that we're, we're accumulating for you. But your part is to understand money so that you're not in a situation where you feel trapped. A lot of our people struggle with depression. Depression tends to be linked to a lack of options. When they study rats, they study rats that were depressed, and they found that the most depressed rats, they measure the serotonin in the brain. And they, they, they found that the rats who had the most uh, depression symptoms were the rats that were put in a situation they couldn't get out of. They were locked up, they couldn't, they were in pain, and they couldn't figure out a way to get out of it. So a lot of our people are in pain and don't know how to get out of that situation. We're in these painful, tough situations that lead us to be depressed. And, and, and so that freedom piece is critically important, and typically that lack of freedom links back to money. It links back to where you are financially. So I said, as a young black woman, I think that the goal, rather than me telling you to be a dancer or an engineer or a teacher, I think you should be all of that. But first, we need to, I'm going to make sure that you are financially good. And when you're financially good and you have knowledge yourself and you commit to being a good person and doing the things that matter to you, I think you have a pretty good shot at being happy. So, so think about things in that way. Again, when you're talking about mentality, you're talking about consciousness and awareness, that awareness of what's going to make you happy is, is, is far deeper than what you're going to get from public school systems, media, or anything else. It really has to come from you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, and I hope this helps you out. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have more of a statement, but also uh, I work in the school system in, uh, in, Green, uh, in, in Prince George County. And uh, we're trying to assimilate economics and academics into the charter school work in here. So hopefully we get a chance to uh, figure out how the line set up. I can talk to you uh, later on because I really have been asking them what you're saying right now about economic uh, freedom. So thank you. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Another question? Yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Boyce. Uh, I want to know, um, 
Because right now we are in a very important economic time, in my opinion. Um, so what's your view when it comes to Bitcoin and um, Black America? Uh, what's my view with Bitcoin and Black America? Uh, I buy Bitcoin consistently, but I'm always prepared for the other shoe to drop because uh, I still think crypto is kind of a new investing space um, that can be easily disrupted. Uh, just this past week, China uh, made some announcements that kind of almost made transactions in cryptocurrency pretty much illegal. Uh, they didn't outlaw the uh, possession of cryptocurrency, but they, the government has been very unpredictable, and they could do that at some point. Nobody knows. Uh, and the reason I mention China is because China and, and Asian countries are supporting uh, the price of cryptocurrency pretty good. Like they, they're really enthusiastic about it. And so these little factors, these little unknowns, are the things you want to be careful about. So I do invest in Bitcoin. Um, I don't put more than 10% of my portfolio in it though, uh, because uh, it, 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 it can disappear any second, but then it can also go to the moon. If they leave it alone, I think it's gonna go to the moon, but if they keep messing with it, bad things can happen. Also, Ethereum is uh, is one of my favorite cryptos because there's a lot of great stuff being built on Ethereum, like the NFT networks and stuff like that. I think Ethereum has a tremendous amount of potential. So most of my crypto money, I invested in about like 20, 25 different coins. Actually, you go to drboyscrypto.com. I, I have a screenshot of all the different cryptos I own. So if anybody wants to take a look, you can. But So I dabble in all of them, just kind of mess around, you know, you know that little, little roll the dice that we all have. But when you talk about long-term holdings that I think are really going to pay off, I'm thinking about those those big dogs, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I also like Cardano. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. So, so, I'm glad to actually been in Philly probably about two years ago. I used to do some stock market. Um, I got that for my job in July because the stock market has become so different. And um, at the end of the day, we were talking about starting up um, an investment group, and I like to start on my own. I need some advice on how to get that started. Okay, well, let's see. So, to, you want to form an investment group, an investment club? Um, there, there's a, uh, let me see. Well, I, I, can't, I can't teach it to you right, like right now, right? But, um, but there's instruction out there, not just online, but also in the Black Business School, which everybody can get started in the Black Business School for free, the blackbusinessschool.com. So feel free to take a look. Uh, we do have some stuff in there on how to form an investment club. And that's important because a lot of, a lot of wealth that's built in, in this society is built with groups and clubs and things like that. And an investment club has a lot of value that goes beyond just how much money you make. Uh, just fellowshipping and networking with other people is an incubator of e economic possibility. You know, like that's just is born out of that. It's like if I have a nightclub and I bring together the prettiest girls in town and the, the, the most eligible bachelors in town, you know, some things will happen, right? Some things will pop off. Babies will be born. People get married. Things like that. So the same thing is true with an economic club. Uh, when you get together, what you're doing is you're bringing not just your money together, you're bringing your ideas together. You're bringing your networks together. You're, you're creating an economy. An economy is created, uh, you know, the same way you, um, you, you, you create anything, the same way you, you bring them together to make babies or whatever the case may be. Economies are created by basically people coming together and sharing resources, and wealth literally rises when you're together. If you take a group of people that are working together and making money and you spread that group apart, a lot of wealth just disappears. So come together. So form an investment club is a great idea. So look, well, we got time for some questions, so y'all make sure y'all ask a few. Alright? So um uh, I just want to acknowledge um Sister Tolu in the building. Give a big round of applause for this support. You had this piece for a long time. And my, my, my queen Monica is in the building. With my son is right in the rain. And Yeah, this one makes an acknowledgement. And Sister Janaki and her king is in the building. And my man brother David. David from the, from the barber shop for a long time. <laughs> Alright, so um, who's the next question? We got. Alright, go here. Alright. You, you got the camera. Yes, sir. Oh, the stock option, yeah. Um, stock options masterclass.com. Uh, that's the class I have in stock options. Stock options masterclass.com. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, so really, you mentioned um, throwing things that actually make you happy. Um, so one of the things that are really make me happy and just kind of, uh, at least from a family member, I think it's weird, but I, I like to look at stock. You know, so I'm an investor, also a key stock I've been trading. And so as a result, I've been able to uh, actually develop a business around what I love. And also, as a result of me developing a business around what I love, around what I love I've actually turned my personal expenses into tax problems. So can you talk about that? Yeah, um, one of the best benefits of owning a business is that you take advantage of, of a natural, uh, America's a rare country, let's just say it like that. This country is, um, you know, if, if, if any, any theory you have about corruption and, and uh, inequality in America, all those theories are true. That's, that's just a fact. So I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think any of us has that ability to change any of that but you have the ability to gain a consciousness of it and shift your behavior so that you're benefiting from the way it's structured, right? So one of the craziest things about this country is that most, a lot of the taxes that are paid in this country are paid by people who work a job every day. So you go to work, you get your money, you, you don't have any write-offs, so a big chunk of your check, it, it, all of us have experienced this, I'm sure most of us have, uh, a big chunk of your check is just gone, you know, because it's going toward taxes. Well. People that own businesses, and I'm not just talking about rich people, I'm talking about people that have a business mentality. Uh, they are able to take advantage of the fact that people that run businesses or have wealth tend to pay a lower tax rate, because the capital gains tax is lower than the income tax. And also, you can write off so many things uh, that literally reduces your income to almost nothing. And, um, and, and I mean, when my accountant got done doing my taxes a couple years ago, I almost felt guilty. I said, I should be paying, this is a lie, like, I'm not this broke. But, but she was just like, well, you can write off this and this and this and this. And, and what it was was that uh, if you have a business that is tied to things you love to do anyway, tied to your family and tied to, uh, you know, whatever activity you're passionate about, you kind of get to write off your life, right? You, you get to write off so many things that it is, it's not fair, but it's not illegal. And so uh, this is another reason why I believe every family in our community should have a family business. Uh, have a good, make sure you got a good accountant that's not going to get into no shady stuff, right? Don't get into where you just write stuff off that you're not supposed to write off. Be honest. But uh, even in that context, you can write off so many things and put yourself in such an advantageous position, it's ridiculous. So, so you, you're right. You know, he, he's 100 percent correct. Uh, everybody in fact with your kids, maybe encourage them to have an LLC or something by a certain age. Uh, also, stop thinking that what you do for a living has to be disconnected from what you want to do for your life. Right? A lot of us grew up learning about things like work-life balance. Uh, like, okay, I gotta find a way to live my life and in between going to work. Uh, and, and really the better term is work-life blend. How do you connect the things you love to a business model. And so when I talk to my kids about what they want to do when they grow up, we don't even talk about professions. I say, what do you love? What are you passionate about? And then if you understand economics, then you'll understand that almost anything that you're passionate about has an economic model somewhere in there. Our 17-year-old loves video games, and I said, you know this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Like, you don't have to play video games in between all the other stuff you're doing. Like, that can literally be a part of how you make your money. And the other interesting thing, here's another funny thing about, um, about starting businesses and all sorts of stuff that was really, that tripped me out, is I, I said this to my friend, I said, you know, it's interesting how, for most people, the difference between complete freedom and, and corporate slavery is not a lot of money. It's like four or $5,000 a month, right? Literally, that's it. So if you, if you raise your kids and teach them just how to generate four or $5,000 a month, you can actually do that yourself if you invest with them while they're little. They can have assets you put in an annuity and have the check just come in to them every month or whatever. But, but, but seriously, if you can show them how to generate some kind of business model that will get them at least four or $5,000 a month, that'll be great. Because I'm going to tell you, when, when I did not have to work for those horrible racist people on that job, <laughs> I literally was okay with making half of what I was making working. Because at least I can stay home instead of dealing with your crazy ass. Right? right? So, Hi, my name is Lashanya. Um, super excited. I just want to thank, um, thank you for allowing us to be here. We've been doing this 
for this to open our eyes. I'm a person. I want to say thank you for your lecture. I'll pay the attention. I watch you sometimes on social media, but I'm not consistent with it due to my business schedule about corporate life and trying to do entrepreneurship, honestly. Um, I thought I was woke. Let me start there. Since you brought that out, um, I thought I was conscious. I thought I knew. But coming here made me see how sleep I was. You know, I'm in between. I actually woke up and still sleeping, really waiting on my friends. <laughs> so um, my question is, I have a, a young son. I have six children, but my youngest is eight, and then the next is 21. My big kids, they out there doing their thing. But my youngest son, he is different from the rest. Um, he came out with um, not something learned, but something gifted. Right, he came out of our window. So my thing, I see a lot of people have brought their children here, and my son, like I tell him, he's already two strikes against him. He's black, and he's a black man, right? And my son always say, I want to be an entertainer. Like I want to have my own business. I want to be an entertainer, and I'm so stuck on you have to learn, you have to learn, you have to read. By the age of three, you gotta read chapter books. By the age of five, you gotta do this. So he's super smart in academics. But now it's not balancing. And he always tells me, I'm going to be successful, mom. Don't worry about it. His dreams are big. His money is big. For Christmas, he didn't get his million dollars in his box. He just freaked out. Like, he, everything for him is over the top. And I'm trying to understand him because he's a kid I've never had before or experienced. And I have a box. I have a roadmap laid out for him. But he's going against what I have for him. And I don't want to say it's bad. He want to do something. Ma, I love games. Let me hear you too. My kids say, put him on social media. He loves to dance. He's not shy. All his uh, Caucasian teachers, oh, we love him. But the only thing they want to do is put him in entertainment. Oh, he could dance. He could this. And I'm saying, no, my son is smart. He can read. He know how to do his math. He can read big words. He know how to smell. So how do I get how a parent that is trying to be bored help to make that kid be something in entrepreneurship, because you spoke about that with your 10 year old, so that we don't get so confused, because I'm corporate minded like crazy. You understand? Mm, how do we right. Get so, how do you, okay, so, what I would say is, um, yeah, no, it's okay. It sounds like you're passionate about your son. I think that's good. Uh, no, no, that's good. If it wasn't for my mother, you know, cussing out some teachers when I was a kid, I, I wouldn't be here right now. Uh, and she had to, she had to, because I had a lot of that same type of energy. And, uh, you know, when I was five, I used to jump up and down. I couldn't sit still. And uh, and the teacher, who was this young white lady, she told my mother the story. She said, she said, yeah, your son won't sit down. And he kept moving around and messing with people, walking around the room. And she said, so I'm going to embarrass him. And so she said that she taught everything, and she said, now I'm going to embarrass him by making him repeat to me everything I taught while he was running around and jumping up and down. And she said, and she goes, and you know, your son recited to me every single thing <laughs> that I had said. And so what this uh, young white woman said to my mother, which was very helpful to her, was she said, be careful because they're going to try to put him on medication. They're going to try to basically re misinterpret what he is. He's not stupid. You know, he's, he, he's alert. Uh, don't let them do that. So my mother fought the school system for many years uh, because, you know, I was a little bit different. And um, and I still act a fool, right? To this day, I'll still be acting a fool, right? And so that, all that is is a little voice coming out. So with that being said, I um, I applaud the fact that you're observing with your son. And, and and I'm not here on any level to write a text, write a textbook on parenting because we all none of us get it completely right. Uh, but what I can say is I, I find that observing the children in terms of knowing what their strengths are and what their passions are. Uh, typically great people are people that typically connect with their passion, that they, they, they connect with what they love and they're good at it, right? If you get those two things in the same room and then you back it up with some work ethic, that's where genius comes from, that's where greatness comes from. So, uh, so I think you're right to uh, not put a limitation on him. Uh, we know what happens at school. They, they, you know, you got the rapper box or the athlete box that a lot of black boys get put into, uh, and those boxes are fine. There's nothing wrong with being a rapper. Nothing wrong with being an athlete. Uh, my buddy Bernard back there, Big Nard, he's a rapper. He's got. See, we use the word bar in it. He's got bars. So you know, so there's nothing wrong with that that rapper athlete box. 
but also Bernard is a, is a trained uh, computer engineer, right? That's the yeah, so so, uh, so there's many spaces, uh, in, in, uh, like our son, he's six foot six, everywhere he goes, they ask him the obvious, like, well, what, who do you play for, right? And he gets offended by that. Um, but, you know, but he's, he's also actually an engineer. He's in, he's in college to study that. So uh, I would just make sure that he understands all the things that he can do. And I do think that black males have to be uh, raised a little differently because you're up against something a little different in this society. Uh, I, I think that there, I can say that if I was trying to get through corporate America, I would have been fired by now. And, uh, I, and I think that that history of the white male seeing us as a threat in every single way is 100% completely true. And, uh, and so it does not mean that you can't try those certain paths. But what I have found is that you never go wrong by giving yourself options. Options and freedom are connected to one another. So, uh, so that means that if your son is an athlete, uh, he should know that he can be more than an athlete. That if the sports thing stops, he's not supposed to go sit on the corner with a liquor bottle and waste his life away. There's other things you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be a community leader, a husband, a father, and all these other great things that a man can do to, to add to value to society. Or if he goes into corporate America and he's got that degree from Duke University and gets that job at Google, and then they somehow fired him because he's just too black or because he's six foot five and dark skinned and, and intimidatingly ambitious or whatever it is we get fired for. He's, he has that know-how and the confidence to say, I can do it on my own, I can step away. I remember being almost embarrassed when I, when I really, when I came to the conscious realization that I had been trained to believe that I can't pay my own bills without a white man's help. And that was embarrassing. That made me feel like, man, I, I don't even feel like a man right now. Wait a minute, you mean, it's not because I remember that fear of quitting the job and saying, well, what am I going to do? They're going to blackball me. And I had the highest level of education you could have in my field. Right? I had a good salary when I was at Syracuse, and I remember uh, I would get warned. People would say, well, if you keep talking like this and doing this, day, you're going to get blackballed and no university will hire you. And, and all that became true. And I just remember, thank you for making the comments. And, uh, and, and, and I just said, wait a minute, this ain't right. It ain't supposed to be like this. Like, number one, I'm not supposed to just give my knowledge to other people. I'm supposed to bring it to my people. That's the first thing. So a lot of us are trained. We, a lot of us don't become successful because we don't even know what success really looks like for a black person. Right? We think success means the house in the suburbs and the fancy corporate job. And my question is, what are you pouring into your community? Because uh, I can tell you, the brothers that, that put all this together are more successful than the Black male, all that stuff about the black male being the endangered species and all that stuff, that is 100% true. And I don't feel sorry for you because of that. Because when you were at war, nobody feels sorry for you. You're not a goddamn baby. You stand up and you fight and you figure it That's out. That's right. That's what we That's do. Right. That's right. I'd like to thank another very strong brother now in our community. Give up a brother, M.O. Tell. I got a good question. Um, with the economy shifting uh, with this pandemic and everything, I just want to know how you feel about uh, opening up a storefront, especially with e-commerce, like selling things online, and you know that's about raising the bar. Uh, how do you feel? Is it safe to open up a storefront? Is that still a good investment? I think it is, uh, because I think human beings still want to see each other. Uh, but I do think that the incorporation of, of the digital backdrop to whatever you do is just the way the world works now, right? So it, it definitely isn't an either or, it's a both and. Uh, now, if we talk about investing in the storefront, because of the conditions right now, it is, it is riskier. But uh, there are more opportunities because everybody's scared now, right? So a lot of these buildings are, you know, people are, are breaking their leases and all this other stuff, so that might be a chance to get, you know, if you're a long-term investor, it might be a chance for you to go ahead and get into a situation that would have been tough before the pandemic. Uh, but, but there could be some short-term problems because there's a lot of uncertainty right now in America. Nobody knows where this is gonna go. Uh, this pandemic, they, I think they said it's, it's gonna be endemic, meaning that the virus is never gonna go away. We're gonna have to learn to live with it. And, and what that future looks like, nobody knows. But I wouldn't make too many long-term decisions based on short-term temporary conditions. Remember, this is just a moment in time. 
Five years from now, we'll remember the pandemic, but it won't be defining our country at that time. So keep making your moves and look at the bigger picture instead of, and don't let, the, the, don't let this moment shape too much of your vision and uh, decision making. Okay. But yeah, so I think a storefront can still be a good move. Just be very cautious though. Right. Thank you. So of course I follow you on social media and you're always talking about building up as well as the stock market and being able to invest and also diversifying as well. So of course I have a decent portfolio, ETFs, individual stocks. I've done crypto since like 2016. Um, but one thing I haven't heard you mention, I may not miss the video, but um, I've also done investing with, um, through equity crowdfunding through uh, the whole jobs act and being able to invest in uh, pre-IPO companies, pre uh, private companies. So I want to see uh, what your thoughts are with equity crowdfunding, of course, that allows people who aren't accredited investors to be able to invest in companies before they go public. And uh, I'll become an accredited investor now too, but still want to make sure that the 20 some companies that I have invested in that it was a good idea or what your thoughts are. I think, uh, and you're right, uh, you, you didn't miss the video because I, I haven't done a lot of videos on it. Maybe because uh, I, I, I understand the area, but you know, as, a, as a, you know, in terms of being a person that's heavily experienced there, that's not necessarily a strong suit. But I can speak to it um, as a person who has participated in some of that equity crowdfunding. Uh, so, so I can tell you what it is in my view, what I, what I see it as. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's always such a, a, a magical type of investment, right? There's all different ways, all the humans, it sounds like you, you're doing a really good job of really spreading your eggs out and participating in all the different ways around to make money. Uh, you know, a lot of us feel that IPOs are just this wonderful investment, and, and as you know, a lot of IPOs are just garbage, right? And also what I have found is that investing in pre-IPO companies in the equity crowdfunding space or even uh, private deals people have brought to me or companies that might go public is that it is uh, not very liquid, right? It's gonna take some time, years, before you really see that ROI. And uh, and so I've, been, I've anticipated, there are a couple companies like that where I've kind of said, okay, yeah, I'll put some money in. And, and, they, and it's been okay. Um, uh, and I think people should know about it, but I, I wouldn't see it as like, okay, this is the, the way to, to, the, to go, this is where I should put all my money. Because remember that if you put your money into a small business that isn't generating revenue yet, it's gonna take a while for that investment to turn over. You may not be able to just sell it, you know, just like that, like you can with a stock. Uh, so as long as you know what it is, then I think it's okay. So I do agree with you, brother, that equity crowdfunding is something worth looking into. Uh, I like the way the Jobs Act kind of opened the door for that, for unaccredited investors. I think that's been great for a lot of companies. And uh, I say, why not? You know, and that's usually, honestly, that's my answer for almost all types of investments that make sense, is why not? The only time it, that the answer doesn't apply is when you talk about like a Dogecoin or Shiba Inu and all that, that's all not, like, that's, that's all not real, that's fake, that's gambling, right? So I'm not saying don't do it, but just know that that's not investment. But everything else, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll put some money in it, you know? And it's really, really with equity crowdfunding, what I also like about it is, that investing doesn't just have to be about how much money you're going to make. It can be about what you just really enjoy, what you want to be a part of. You know, and so if you go to an equity crowdfunding site, like, well, I don't know, what, what's your favorite equity crowdfunding site? Uh, Star Engine and WeFunder. What's that? Star Engine and WeFunder. Star Engine and WeFunder. Yeah, WeFunder are familiar with the other one or not. But yeah, maybe check it out. And if you see some businesses that you, uh, that inspire you or you want to just take pride in being a part of it, uh, I say go for it. Uh, because remember, investing in wealth building is a culture. It, 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 it's something where if you just make it part of what you just do consistently to the point where you made so many investments, you, you can't even hardly remember everything you invested in because that's just what you do. Like, so for example, if I was to ask you, uh, spending, spending is already a culture, right? So if I said to you, uh, what did you do with all the money that you made in 2013? You probably couldn't tell me. You can't tell me where you spent even, probably even a third of the money that you spent in 2013. Right? Uh, because spending is just such a habit, you're just doing it. You're just spending the money, you're making it rain, you know, some other restaurant, all kinds of shoes, right? Well, I think with investing, it should be the same way. Uh, because I am a spendaholic. I, 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 that was my biggest problem. But every time I look at my budget, and I, I would think about stuff I want to cut out, 
I would just get pissed off because I didn't want to cut nothing in my budget because I, I would just spend and money would burn a hole in my pocket. And, and I realized instead of cutting my budget, cutting my spending, maybe I can just figure out how to make more money. But I got two things. One, I figured out how to make more money. And two, what I found was, and again, this is all psych psychological, so we go back to mentality, is I realized that investing gave me the same high as spending. Mm. The difference is, because it's all about those endorphins in your brain. It's all about mm. the high. We all chase the high, right? No matter what it is. Everybody got a high you chase it. It might be the food you eat or whatever, right? So you just got to have everything in balance and moderation. So what I would do is that I realized, I said, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I think I went from being a spender, Holly, to be an investor, Holly. Mm. I, I get money, and I'm like, oh, what stocks can I buy now? And I'm like, okay, so I've taken this, this, I hate using the word addiction, that just sounds so degenerative. But I, I've made it into something that actually benefits me as opposed to harm me. You understand? So, so if you're going to be addicted to things, Four of those healthy addictions, right? Like there are people that get addicted to running or get addicted to vegan food, right? Like they're, they're addicted to like addicted to my family. I'm addicted to spending time with my family, my wife, whatever, right? So find those things that are healthy as opposed to things that are destructive. One of the biggest things is, you mentioned the psychological part, you got to have faith in what you're doing. I really don't have a man tell me in my head about what I'm going on. The Almighty is in charge. It's like, it's like talk if everybody needs it. If you want to invest in something, got to make sense. Mm -hmm. I've got, got a lot of education, but it got to be sensitive. All right. Two, 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 two days. So, these type of things that, that we create our own brands, and then we support one another, which is what has been a very you know, I've been on the corners and just going to the ball for the last three years. It's that same fight, but I enjoy it, I love it. We agree with you, but that, that psychological pain of fighting each other about, you know, when you're going to do my else, you see a man with a guy on the tip coming to me and you, you got to go so like a bitch. I'm not going to just stop. I'm going to just sit. That's how I can do it. It'll make me stop. And even in the pandemic, I'm small, I'm small in this matter. I'm, I'm urban, by tree. And uh, I haven't felt any, I mean, uh, God, I haven't seen where, realistically, uh, you can't make it. Importing, exporting, clothes out, I mean, food is off everybody. Uh, clothes out, so it's a lot of money. Waste is what you buy, it's waste money. Right? You gotta know what you buy. What's the set? You know, you can get it, and, 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 and like, you and that, right? I got two of my friends in, 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 in Gambia, one of them in the, uh, Tanzania, and also like, you get money here, you get money here, you go with that, you got here, help your brother's dad, you go with that, 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 down to earth, for violence and food. The one of the sickness is it's a curse. Everything's talking about that. And I want to live this, but I appreciate you. I watch you all the time. Thank like, you. I'm, but I'm not a shock I could do this, and I got you on here as far as uh, <laughs> investing in the stocks. I think there's some kind of personal hand walking. You know, I got a little uh, business thing on here. I'm, I'm not really that good with stock. But I saw how I get your number or call you or how you can get your number. Get the, you know, right now I'm buying silver, I'm, I'm buying a lot of silver and gold. I got some silver in mind, so do you think that's a good investment? Uh, silver and gold? Uh, but remember, two minutes ago, remember I said, why not? Sure, you know, I, I own some silver, I own some gold, mostly through ETFs, uh, exchange trading funds. I don't own the actual bars. Uh, but I know this, you know, you make it and stuff like that, but um, um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't see gold and silver as something that will make you rich. Right. But there are some people that believe that gold is a good hedge against uh, inflation. And, uh, they, you know, inflation is, is a concern because you see the government really spending money it doesn't have. So the value of their dollar is dropping. Uh, but it's not a, a state of emergency. You know, I, I, I hear a lot of people that, that, that can become very alarmist about everything that's going to collapse. But you got to remember that, you know, 
This isn't the first generation where we have people telling us the economy is going to collapse. There have been people since 1920 that have been writing books about how the, you know, how our economic system is going to go to hell and collapse, and it hasn't happened, right? It, it, you know, so so I would rather than assuming that it's going to all collapse. Uh, assume that it's going to survive, and, and just make sure you make the appropriate adjustments. And, and uh, to your point also about uh, Africa, one of the things about that, I think that's a good way for, us, for me to finish up on this, is there is so much economic potential in the continent of Africa. And everybody is seeing this. A lot of people around the world, you're not the only one seeing this. Uh, Europeans are seeing it. We know China's seeing it. And, uh, and, and I mean, it's, it's really fascinating, again, mentality, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, if you go to Africa, you sit there, and, I, and when I went to Ghana, I sat there and I just looked at the map of Africa. Here I am, a 40-some-year-old man with a PhD at the time, and I'm looking at all the countries and really becoming conscious and aware of how big they are. And, and oh, this country has 100 million people, this country has 50 million, this one. And, and, and I'm seeing this, and, and I'm sitting there just uh, embarrassed over the fact that I never had that consciousness as a kid, right? And, 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 I, and I would say to you that when you're talking about building long-term visions for the future, um, number one, make sure your kids don't have that same limitation, right? Make sure they understand Africa, what's happening there, and how many millions, over a billion allies that you have in Africa when it comes to how you structure business, things like that. Because Africa is the next great emerging economy. That continent is going to blow up the same way India blew up, the same way China blew up. Africa's next. They got the youngest population on Earth. And those, I mean, those are your relatives, right? Uh, and, and so, 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 but it gets you think. Doing business requires that word relationships. And if I feel like, if I've been raised to believe that I have nothing in common with somebody from an African country, then how are we going to form a relationship of any form, right? So in order for me to form a relationship with you, I've got to learn you, understand you, and respect you, and then connect with you. And then over time, those, those trade channels start to develop, like this brother's developed with, with, with so many countries with, with your import and export uh, commodities. So, so what I would say is this. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. I remember hearing uh, Jeff Bezos, who runs Amazon, and he gave a speech that was really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a, an enthusiast about space, out of space. And he gave this crazy speech where he talked about building artificial planets. And he was explaining how instead of going to Mars and all that, uh, we just build a planet and make, and make the weather into whatever we want and create beaches and mountains and all sorts of I'm like, this is crazy. Like, we don't have the technology to do this. Right? And he said that. He said, we can't do any of this right now. He said, but what you can do is if you think about this across multiple generations, you can lay the foundation. You plant the seeds. You lay the framework. So he said, you know, I couldn't have built Amazon if, it, if somebody before me hadn't built the U.S. Postal Service. That was our bridge to being able to build Amazon on top of the infrastructure that was developed in the previous generation. So he said, now maybe we're building infrastructure to get people into space. And then the next generation, they build on top of that to be able to build whatever they're going to create, right? And so maybe three generations down the line, you've got these artificial planets. Everything has to be built on something. Everything is teamwork that goes across generations. So, so my point to you that I make right now is stop thinking that you are the be-all, end-all to all of this. Stop thinking that you're going to see the mountaintop. Stop thinking that you're going to be there for the whole thing and all this other stuff. No, you are here to plant a seed that will build a bridge for the next step that will occur in the next generation. Yeah. The greatest manifestations of what you're doing right now are going to occur after you are dead. Mm -hmm. And that's where, when you go back to mentality, that requires something called faith that says, even if I plant seeds with this raggedy little business, and I'm teaching my kids that they go into the shop, that they make no money with me every day, mm -hmm. and learn how to be entrepreneurs by watching me constantly make mistakes, that that's going to plant a culture and seeds in them that they are going to build on and they're going to do it better than you and your grandkids will do it better than them and your great grandkids will do it better than them. So plant the seed, build the infrastructure, develop the roads. Talk about Africa, let's develop the roads and the channels to Africa and the next generation, they can figure out how to develop the billion dollars of commerce that's necessary, right? Maybe we can't do that in this generation, it may be tough for some of us. 
But if we open those pathways, our children will be able to start at the age of nine with more knowledge than many of us will have at 49. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Plant the seed. Thank you all very much. We have Dr. Gordon Blockley. Big round of applause. Now look, what are we going to do now? So Dr. Boyce will be available to take a few pictures with, with some folks and we're going to stand here and socialize for a little. Let's support the business. We got food back there. We got all kinds of products. We got books. We got t-shirts. We got water. We got uh, other skincare products that we have in the building. So let's support the business. Um, and uh, you want to, I don't even want you to speak on the, uh, the, uh, the conference you got coming up. Say something about that right quick. Uh, every year we have the All Black National Convention, uh, which is going to be this year is going to be in Orlando, the weekend of October 29th through November 1st. Uh, we've gathered about 40 different experts uh, from our community in all different fields and arenas uh, that are there to solve problems. Uh, and this year will be bigger than ever. Uh, we're not just having uh, big panels on everything from relationships to politics to uh, to economics, but we're also having breakout sessions on uh, crypto, how to grow your own food. Uh, Maj Ture, people like that will be there talking about how to live off the grid if that's what you want to do. Uh, we're going to have uh, breakouts on um, how to invest in the stock market, right? how to get your business off the ground, and most importantly, our goal is to bring people together. So if you uh, want to look into it, you can go to allblacknationalconvention.com. Uh, that's allblacknationalconvention.com. Uh, we do not take uh, sponsorship from corporations that are outside of our community, uh, but, but if you have a business and you want to be a vendor, uh, it's a great vendor space because everybody there understands the importance of buying black, so we make sure our vendors make money. And uh, we, you, everybody is welcome to come to bring your family, bring your investment club, bring your church group, whatever it is you want to bring. Uh, because this is where problems are solved and wealth is being created, and it's totally funded and built by us, which means that we get to save you whatever the heck we want. So God bless you. Thank you. So stick around for a little bit, Dr. Maya, if you don't want to tell you something about our business right here, and we're going to close out. How many of you enjoy Dr. Boyce while it's Consciousness creates the world we live in. So if you have a poor consciousness, then you're going to have a poor world. If you have a rich consciousness, then you're going to have a rich and wealthy world. And what we have done was give over or hand over the development of the consciousness of our children to our open enemy. And so we have to take that back. How do we take that back? Dr. Amos Wilson says that we have to control the institutions that condition or condition our consciousness. And what are those institutions? Education and media. So we have to educate our own babies. Carter G. Wilson said what? We're the only people. He said we're the only people to hand over our babies' minds to another group of people. We're the only people who do it. So we have to educate our babies and we have to produce and control our own media. And that is what the Mel Track program is about. At the age of 15 and 13, I had my two sons. This is 2013, true story. Uh, I was noticing that my three-year-old, he was engaged in a lot of mindless media. And I said, hold up, we need to create some sort of animation that will teach him about the history and culture and achievements of our people. And so I, we came up with the concept Mel Track. Right? Mel is short for melanin. Trek means journey. So we're taking you on a journey to understand and learn about the history, culture, and achievements of black people. And so my son Harvey is with us today. I know that he spoke earlier today. So before you leave, make sure that you come on over to the table. I literally went to each of these vendors and purchased something. So please make sure that you go to Be More, 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 more Codified. Holler at them. Go to the sisters over here who are selling uh, the scrubs and the, uh, what do you got over there? Scrubs and, and sea moss. The brother over here with the jewelry. Make sure that you go and that you patronize each and every one of the vendors. Thank you so much. Right. If you can stand, let's close out the record. The power of Rome is what? When we close out, that don't make leaves. Stick around, we'll make some pictures.
Go to the goodness, all right? So let's close out. We're going to close out with our Harambe. For the seventh time, we're going as long as we possibly can. We do it like, go seven times, all right? So we're going to put our black power fist in the air. Okay, one, two, three. Harambe! Thanks a lot.